Welcome back. In this video, we will study the fundamental theorem of algebra. We will also find all the zeros of polynomial functions and we'll investigate conjugate pairs of complex zeros. Here is the fundamental theorem of algebra. And essentially, the fundamental theorem of algebra says that if we have a polynomial of a particular degree n, there will be at least one zero in the complex number system. And we use this to determine that n is greater than zero, then our function has n linear factors. Now some of them might be complex and some of them might be real. And remember, real numbers are a subset of the complex number system. So really what we have found out here, if we have a polynomial function of a particular degree, we will have at least that many complex zeros. And remember, real numbers are a subset of the complex number system. Our first sample here, determine the number of zeros of x to the fourth minus one. Since we have a polynomial of degree four, we know that we have four zeros in the complex system. We don't know how many real ones we'll have, but we know we'll have four complex ones. So another sample, we want to confirm that the same function, x to the fourth minus one, has exactly four zeros x equals plus or minus one and plus or minus i. So we'll give you the zeros, we just need you to confirm that. We know our zeros are our x-intercepts, so we set our function equal to zero and we go ahead and factor. And fully factored, we get x plus one times x minus one, but what about the x squared plus one? We've said we really couldn't factor that. Well, Think about if we did the square root property with x squared plus one. If we did x squared plus one equals zero, we'd get x squared equals negative one. We square root both sides, and we get x equals plus or minus the square root of negative one. So that actually can be factored into x plus the square root of negative one and x minus the square root of negative one. Now, that's not real, but it's still factorable. So we find out indeed that our factors are x plus one times x minus one, and since the square root of negative one is i, x plus i times x minus i. And setting all these equal to zero, we do get our zeros of plus or minus one and plus or minus i. Objective two, we were going to write our function x to the fifth plus x cubed plus two x squared minus 12 x plus eight as a product of linear factors and list all the zeros of f. Because we have eight over one, our possible zeros are plus or minus one, plus or minus two, plus or minus four, and plus or minus eight using all the factors of eight and one. We know, because we have x to the fifth, that we will have a total of five zeros. That's a lot of options, so we'll grab our graphing utility, we'll input the function, and see what we get. So I input my function into my graphing calculator, I go ahead and graph, and I see that I have real zeros at negative two, and one, and at one, we bounce. So there is a double root at one. So that's two of our zeros. So we have three of our five zeros, they're real. So the other two must be complex. So we have a pass-through zero at x equals negative two and a bounce zero at x equals one. So we know our real factors are x plus two and two factors of x minus one. And as I mentioned previously, the other two must be imaginary. So I'm gonna confirm this with synthetic division. I'm gonna start with my x equals one. 
and do synthetic division. So I put my coefficients from my original problem in my top row. My divisor is one. I prime my pump with the one. I complete my synthetic division. I get a remainder of zero. These are all positive. It appears that one is an upper bound. And we move on to again doing our repeated division with one again with our second zero of one. My divisor again is one. I grab my coefficients from my first result of synthetic division. I bring those down for my coefficient row. I have my divisor of one. I prime my pump with my coefficient of one. And I follow my synthetic division process. And again, I get a remainder of zero. So my coefficients are now one, two, four, and eight. And I complete synthetic division again with my other factor of x equals negative two. So I grab those coefficients and I put them up here. So I have coefficients of one, two, four, and eight. I prime my pump with the one and I multiply negative two times one is negative two and add down. Negative two times zero is zero and add down. Negative two times four is negative eight and add down. Excellent, confirms again that negative two is a factor because my remainder is zero. My final factor is x squared plus four. So my result so far, I have x minus one times x minus one times x plus two times x squared plus four. Well, we can factor x squared plus four x as x squared minus a minus four using our difference of two squares. And as we saw earlier in this video, that's going to factor to x plus two i and x minus two i. Our fully factored form would be x plus two i times x minus two i times x minus one squared times x plus two. And our zeros are one, negative two, and plus or minus two i. One thing you may have noticed from the samples here is that when we have complex zeros or when we have imaginary roots, they always end up in conjugate pairs. We always end up with two of them. That's an interesting bit of information. You will have samples such as this. Find a fourth degree polynomial function with real coefficients that has negative one, negative one, and three i as zeros. So we have a double root at negative one and three i, but remember it's complex, so not only do we have plus three i, we're also gonna have minus three i. So there are four zeros. So our function in factor form is a, some coefficient a times x plus one times x plus one times x minus three i times x plus three i. So the x minus three i times x plus three i foils to x squared plus nine. And of course our pattern x plus one quantity squared foils to x squared plus two x plus one. We foil all that together. Remember here we let a equal one and we get x to the fourth plus 2x cubed, plus 10x squared, plus 18x, plus 9. We'll do another sample. We want to find a cubic polynomial function, f, with real coefficients at, that has 2 and 1 minus i as zeros, and f of 1 equals 3. So our zeros here are 2 and 1 minus i. They only gave us 2 of the zeros. Okay, since it's cubic, we know it has three zeros though. So we should have three. But one of them is complex. So since complex zeros come as conjugates, we know that they will be come as one minus i and one plus i. So our factors are x minus two and x minus the quantity one minus i and x minus the quantity one plus i. So our function 
looks like this. So we have a times x minus 2 and x minus the quantity 1 minus i times x times the quantity minus the quantity 1 plus i. Well, we have to simplify these. I'm going to distribute that negative through, apply that fraught with peril, if you will. So I get a times x minus 2 times x minus 1 plus i times x minus 1 minus i. Well, I'm going to foil all this that's in red, and that's going to give us the trinomial x squared minus 2x plus 2. I have to do a little more foiling now, right? For lack of a better word, I have to multiply x minus 2 times my trinomial. I do all that foiling, and we get a times x cubed minus 4x squared plus 6x minus 4. So using the factors they gave us, we've got all of this so far. But now they told us this function has f of 1 equals 3. Well, in doing so, they gave us both an x and a y. So we input our x and our y into our function to solve for a. So x is 1, and y, or our output, is 3. So f of x, 3 equals a. I substitute everything in, and I get 3 equals negative 1a. So a is negative 3. So I can substitute negative 3 in for a. I can distribute my negative 3. And we see that our polynomial function then becomes negative 3x cubed plus 12x squared minus 18x plus 12. And that is our final answer. And we'll get some more practice with this when I see you in class.